Distances in space are mind-boggling. The human mind is barely capable of appreciating the scale of the ice-cold abyss of space. Meanwhile, scientific equipment allows us to look thousands and millions of light-years back to find out something new about the world around. Let's use our knowledge and imagination and embark on a virtual journey across the entire universe. We'll start out near the voyages, the lonely roamers that have been drifting through the vast expanses of space for the past half a century. After that, we'll get to the James Webb Orbital Telescope, which will help us visit quite a number of previously unknown worlds. Then it will be time for two amazing planets which may hypothetically harbor life. The rest of our journey will get us far beyond the boundaries of the Milky Way, to the most bizarre and incredible galaxies. The way back is going to take a while, so we'll have enough time on our hands to speculate about the location of the center of the universe and what it's like. Does this place conceal anything exciting, mysterious and weird? Answers to these questions are tucked away somewhere in the depths of space, and it's high time to try to find them. Cosmo. The first outer space. Spacecraft. New Horizons Start of mission 19th of January 2006 Distance to Earth 52 astronomical units Speed 14 km per second or 3 astronomical units per year Main goal Pluto and Charon Mission status Successfully completed Condition Operational Just like most other interplanetary space probes New Horizons performed a gravity assist maneuver near Jupiter before setting out to its target. Not only did it greatly boost the spacecraft's speed, but also allowed it to capture high-quality images of the largest planet in the solar system alongside its satellites. Besides, the probe's cameras captured the first video ever of an erupting volcano on the surface of Jupiter's satellite Io. After the gravity boost had been completed, the probe made for the main target. Pluto. The spacecraft reached the planetoid's environs in January 2015. The mission's main goal was to explore Pluto and Charon from different perspectives that involved taking photos of and mapping these remote space object surfaces. In addition, the probe estimated the magnetic field's values and the solar wind activity close to the objects and collected information about their atmospheres and surface reflection properties. It goes without saying that the program also involved search for Pluto's as yet undetected satellites and more accurate measurements of Pluto's orbit's parameters. Having completed the main mission, the probe continued to be useful. It flew beyond Pluto's orbit and went on to explore objects in the Kuiper Belt. That is how images of Kwawa, R1 and Arakoth were produced. Thanks to the probe's cameras, the distances to the stars Proxima Centauri and Wolf 359 were measured. Unfortunately, the radioisotope generator on board the spacecraft is expected to start running low from 2026 and eventually all the meters will switch off one after another. New Horizons will continue on its way beyond the boundaries of the solar system and by the year 2038, the distance between the probe and the Sun will have grown to be a hundred astronomical units. By that time, the energy generator on board the spacecraft will have stopped operating completely and it will be impossible to get any connection with it. Following a hyperbolic orbit, New Horizons will exit our system, never to come back. The same thing happened with two other probes, Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11. They hit an escape trajectory from the solar system a while ago. In fact, they were the first automatic space probes ever to be sent into interstellar space by humans. Spacecraft Pioneer 10 Start of mission 3rd of March 1972 Distance to Earth 127 astronomical units Speed 
approximately 12 km per second or 2.5 astronomical units per year. Main goal – Jupiter. Mission status – successfully completed. Condition – not operational. The spacecraft reached Jupiter's system on the 4th of December 1973 after completing a 641-day journey through space. During the mission, images of the gas giant's surface and its largest satellites were beamed back to the Earth, and the planet's atmospheric composition and magnetic field were gauged. In addition, Jupiter was found to emit two and a half times more thermal energy than it receives from the Sun. The data, unique at the time, became the basis for understanding the makeup of gas giants and their satellites. The trajectory of the second probe, Pioneer 11 through space, passed Jupiter too, but its main target was the other gas giant of our system, Saturn. The probe's scientific instruments gauged the planet's magnetic field and the cameras on board took quite a few snapshots not only of the gas giant itself and its system of rings, but also two of its satellites, Titan and Mimas. According to the estimates, the current distance between Pioneer 11 and the center of our system is around 106 astronomical units. On completing their main mission, both probes continued on their way, moving further and further away from the Sun. Unfortunately, both of them are out of range now, with the last signal from Pioneer 10 received back in 2003. The last signal from Pioneer 11 was received in 1995. Supposedly, both of them are now rapidly moving beyond the boundaries of the solar system. Incidentally, having no chance of ever catching up with either of the two probes we are going to talk about next, the Pioneers were launched at a much earlier date. Spacecraft Voyager 1 Start of Mission 5th of September 1977 Distance to Earth 154 astronomical units Speed Around 17 km per second or 3.6 astronomical units per year Main goal Jupiter and Saturn Mission status Successfully completed Condition Not fully operational the contribution of Voyager 1 to the solar system's exploration can hardly be overestimated. It is thanks to this probe that several new Jupiter satellites were discovered, alongside its ring system, which was big news. The Voyager's cameras captured volcano eruptions on Io and provided hard evidence that Jupiter's great red spot is an enormous storm. The probe beamed back hundreds of photos of the largest planet of our solar system and its satellites. After the spacecraft crossed Neptune's orbit, the meters on board sent back a great amount of valuable data about interstellar plasma. Voyager 1 left both the Kuiper Belt and the heliopause behind a long while ago, and is now rapidly crossing the area of the solar system's scattered disk, making for the inner boundary of the hypothetical Oort cloud. It is not only the remotest man-made object in space, but also the fastest of all the spacecraft on their way to exit our system. Being the first space probe to have traveled that far from the center of the solar system, Voyager 1 offered scientists a unique opportunity to study the heliopause. This is the area around our Sun where solar wind pressure and interstellar gas pressure balance. When the charged particles emitted by the star collide with rarefied plasma, elaborate structures form out of elementary particles and magnetic fields. Studying them is crucial for understanding processes taking place in the universe. Unfortunately, by around the year 2025, the power of the radioisotope thermoelectric generators on board the probe will have run out completely and the connection will have been lost. In 300 years, Voyager 1 is estimated to reach the inner boundary of the hypothetical Oort cloud. It will take the spacecraft approximately 30,000 years to go clean through and after that, it will fly beyond the boundaries of the solar system. 10,000 years later still, the probe will fly by the star Gliese 445 at a distance of 1.6 light years, and then it will eventually get lost in the infinite depths of outer space. Speaking about Voyager 1, we can't but mention its twin, launched from the Earth on the 20th of August 1977. 
Voyager 2 had Saturn, Uranus and Neptune for its targets, but it also approached Jupiter for a gravity boost. It's the images taken by this probe that allowed scientists to assume that there are subsurface oceans on Ganymede and Europa. On reaching Saturn, Voyager 2 gauged the gas giant's temperature and magnetic field and discovered several new satellites. It goes without saying that lots of snapshots were taken of both Saturn's surface and its rings. Next in line on the probe's way were Uranus and Neptune. The flyby yielded a great number of unique snapshots, and in total 17 of the two planet's satellites were discovered. Also it was found that both Uranus and Neptune have ring systems. Under Neptune's gravitational influence, the spacecraft changed its trajectory and left the ecliptic plane. This meant that Voyager 2 wouldn't be able to approach the other objects in the solar system, but it still had other exciting things to look forward to. Thus, the probe was to collect invaluable data about interstellar plasma and cosmic wind, as well as to measure distances to stars and explore the heliosphere. The probe is currently as far as 128 astronomical units away from the center of our system, with the distance growing by 15.37 kilometers every second. It's going to take it around 42,000 years to approach Ross 248, a dim red dwarf in the constellation Andromeda. The minimal distance between Voyager 2 and the star will be about 1.7 light years, and around 300,000 years since its launch, chances are it will fly by Sirius at a distance of 4.3 light years. Unfortunately, it is impossible to distinguish such a tiny object from the Earth that far away. We live at the dawn of space exploration, and interplanetary space probes are just mankind's first timid steps in exploring the infinite universe. It is hard to predict their fate. They may be smashed on collision with a celestial body, or they may be recaptured by our distant descendants, who will have advanced into stellar travel technologies to the point of being able to catch up with the probes. For all we know, they might recover them from space and put on display in a museum. But it is more likely that the fragile apparatuses are destined to drift on for years and years through the lifeless expanses. And millions of years later, radioactive rays and rare particles of cosmic dust whizzing through the probes time and time again will eventually wear them down to threadbare debris to be scattered across the depths of the universe without a trace. There are approximately 1,400 stellar systems in space within the radius of 50 light-years from the solar system. Some of them are multiple, and contain two and more objects, which makes the overall number of our stellar neighbors over 2,000. These are all sorts of stars, from dim red dwarfs to dazzling giants whose temperatures are beyond our imagination. The incredible scale and great abundance of space objects in all their diversity can't but amaze. Life's too short to give account of each and every one of them. Right now, we're going to travel at incredible speeds, by far faster than the speed of light. It will take us just a few minutes to cover dozens of light years of space. We'll get to check out quite a few remarkable space objects around the solar system. Other worlds and stars are already waiting. After we fly around Proxima Centauri, a detour of 11 light years that would have passed in the blink of an eye, we're in the environs of the dim red dwarf known as Ross 128. We can't see it from the Earth with a naked eye. Unprepossessing though it may seem, there is an Earth-like exoplanet dubbed Ross 128b orbiting this star. This exoplanet is one of the closest to us. Unlike the yet closer and cooler Proxima Centauri b, the temperature on Ross 128b is relatively moderate, ranging from minus 60 to plus 21 degrees Celsius. Assuming its surface to be identical to that of our planet, which absorbs 70% of the light shed on it, the equilibrium temperature of Ross 128b is estimated at around 7 degrees Celsius. It is 8 degrees cooler than that of today's Earth, but quite enough to sustain life. The exoplanet's mass is roughly 35% bigger than that of the Earth. The radius hasn't been accurately measured at this point, 
but provided the planet's composition is similar to our Earth's, its diameter is supposed to be roughly 10% bigger than that of the Earth. The freefall acceleration on its surface is expected to be just 12% bigger than that on our planet. If all these estimations are correct, then the conditions on the surface of Ross 128b are supposed to be comparable with those on the Earth. Besides, the system is rapidly moving to meet the Sun. In just 79,000 years, it will be closer to us than Proxima Centauri, which is moving away from us. Quite like most exoplanets we know of, Ross 128b is located quite close to its host star. The distance from it to the center of the system is just 0.05 astronomical units, or 20 times shorter than the distance between the Earth and the Sun. It takes the exoplanet slightly under 10 days to complete a full orbit around its star. It is also thought that it must be tidally locked. Speaking about its host star, Ross 128, its mass is approximately 17% that of the Sun, with the radius measuring around 0.2 that of the Sun. The star's surface temperature is twice as low as that of the Sun, at 3192 Kelvin, and its luminosity is roughly 300 times lower than that of the Sun. It's worth mentioning that Ross 128 is a comparatively quiet star. With its luminosity quite stable and regular, it hardly ever flares up or emits stellar matter, so pernicious for all living things. Moving on through space, 12 light years in the direction pointing away from the Sun, we will see Lytton's star, also known as GJ273. It boasts one of the largest planetary systems detected in the space nearest to us. The star itself is a red dwarf of an orange hue, whose mass is just 25% that of the Sun. Its radius is three times smaller than that of the Sun and its luminosity is 435 times lower so it's hardly surprising that it can only be seen through a telescope. It is quite an exciting star, because there are as many as four objects detected in its environs, two of which are confirmed exoplanets. The other two are still prospective candidates, awaiting confirmation. The first confirmed exoplanet was dubbed Lytton B. It was detected thanks to high-precision measurement of the star's proper motion. The object's mass is estimated to be about 2.89 times that of the Earth. Its radius is 35% bigger than that of our planet. This makes the object a super-Earth, and its surface gravity may turn out to be suitable for humans. The distance between the system's center and light and B equals roughly 0.1 astronomical units, although the amount of light received by the exoplanet from its parent star is comparable with that received by us from the Sun. Thus, Light and B lies in its star's habitable zone and may well be considered a potential candidate for searching for alien life. The equilibrium surface temperature of the planet is 259 to 292 Kelvin or minus 14 to plus 19 degrees Celsius. This makes the conditions on Light and B quite suitable for humans. The other confirmed exoplanet in the system is Light and C. With this space object's mass similar to that of the Earth, it lies much closer to its host star. The exact parameters of its orbit haven't been defined yet, but it is known that it takes the object just 4.7 days to complete a full orbit around its system's center. It is likely that this is a scorching hot and harsh celestial body without any atmosphere, with one on the same side facing the star at all times. The two other objects in the system were discovered in 2019 and are still awaiting confirmation of their status. According to preliminary estimates, they are ice giants with masses from 5 to 15 times that of the Earth. With the radii of their orbits lying within 0.8 astronomical units, their orbital periods cannot be over 558 days. Lytton is a relatively cold star and with these two objects lying beyond its habitable zone, their temperatures are almost certainly extremely low. It goes without saying that at this stage, these two candidates still want further exploration. Moving on and away from the Lytton system, we will come across a star known as Altair. Lying 16.8 light years away from the Earth, it is a bright, white blue star. Its mass is around 1.8 that of the Sun, and its age is estimated at around 1.2 billion years. This star's luminosity is 11 times that of the Sun, 
which makes it one of the most conspicuous objects in our night sky. Another curious feature of Altair is its rotation, which is remarkably fast. Thus, it spins on its axis approximately 67 times faster than the Sun. It completes a full rotation within slightly less than 9 hours. The velocity of star material at the equator equals about 286 km per second due to this outstandingly rapid rotation. The star's shape is far from an ideal sphere. The star's equatorial diameter is 22% bigger than the distance between its poles and is roughly twice the diameter of the Sun. The star's shape can't but affect its temperature and luminosity, which also differ in its different areas. The stellar matter in the equatorial zone of the star is noticeably colder and darker than in the poles. The temperature at the equator is just 6,900 Kelvin. The poles, meanwhile, are as hot as 8,500 Kelvin, which is around 8,200 degrees Celsius. Interestingly, the fact that Altair has an irregular shape was first arrived at following theoretical calculations. Only later, in 2007, was it finally confirmed after an image of the star was produced, where it is seen to have a disk-like shape. Actually, Altair happened to become the first star beyond the solar system whose surface had been imaged. Unfortunately, no planet has been detected in Altair's environs. Still, observations show rings or a fog of gas enveloping the star. Altair's light is dispersed in these structures, which produces a curious effect. This major interference of light results in a humongous rainbow around the star. On the downside, however, even though it looks fascinating and majestic, it partly conceals the star and so greatly hampers studying it. As we carry on on our way through space, we will get as far as Fomalhaut. Lying 25 light-years away from the Earth, this stellar system consists of three components. For a long time, the three components making it up used to be considered mutually independent space objects. Then, in 2013, evidence showed that they are in fact gravitationally bound, forming a large and single structure in space. Fomalhaut is probably the widest multiple star system located close to ours, the biggest distance between its components reaches 3.2 light-years. Incidentally, almost 11 lunar disks may be placed in our night sky between the remotest objects in the Fomalhaut system. The largest, most well-known and well-seen component of the system is referred to as Fomalhaut A. It's a young and hot star whose mass is 92% bigger than that of the Sun, with its radius measuring around 1.85 times that of the Sun. It was this star that people have referred to as Fomalhaut since ancient times, quite unaware of the fact that there are other, not so easily observable components in this system. The star's luminosity is remarkably high, at 16 times that of the Sun. Its temperature is estimated at roughly 8,500 Kelvin or 8,200 degrees Celsius. Fomalhaut could be as old as 400 to 480 million years. According to today's models of stellar evolution, the star may grow to be around 1 billion years old. On reaching this age, it will more likely than not go supernova and turn into a white dwarf. Fomalhaut A is surrounded by a disk of protoplanetary gas and dust. Divided into several segments, its inner radius is 133 astronomical units, with a width measuring about 25 astronomical units. This disk is thought to be an active stellar nursery, with celestial bodies regularly born there. That is why it is an area of keen interest for astronomers. It used to be thought that there was a massive planet lurking somewhere in Fomalhaut's environs. It was even given a name, Dagon. However, further observations showed that there was hardly any planet there after all. It must have been a wide cloud of dust that was taken for an exoplanet. It would have originated on collision of asteroids and comets. 0.9 light-years away from the main component of the system, there lies Fomalhaut B, also known as T.W. Pisces Ostrini. It's an orange dwarf with a mass around 70% that of the Sun, with its radius roughly 63% that of the Sun. The star's surface temperature is estimated at approximately 4,700 Kelvin, 
which is 4,400 degrees Celsius. Interestingly, the star's luminosity is much lower than that of the Sun. Our host star is five times brighter. In 2019, on carrying out spectral and proper motion analysis, scientists put forward a suggestion that there might be a celestial body as heavy as 0.6 to 1.9 Jupiter masses orbiting the star. The existence of this body still remains to be confirmed and its exact orbit's parameters calculated precisely. At this point, preliminary estimations show that it should take the hypothetical planet 25 years to complete a full orbit around its host star. The third star in the Fermal Howard system is LP 876 10. It is a red dwarf lying two and a half light years away from the main component of the system. The star is five times lighter than the Sun and its surface temperature is slightly over 3100 Kelvin. It takes LP 876 10 approximately 20 million years to complete a full orbit around Fermal Howard A. Apparently, the red dwarf would have orbited its big brother just 22 times since the birth of the system. As for planets or exoplanet candidates, none of these have so far been detected near the star. Still, observations allow us to suppose that there is a cloud of gas and dust around it, whose radius is anything from 10 to 40 astronomical units. Our next and final destination for today is 37.3 light years away from the Earth. That's the distance we would have covered now to reach Arcturus, the brightest star in the northern hemisphere and the fourth brightest star in the night sky. The star is the main component of a binary star system. It is an orange giant whose life is now slowly drawing to a close. Most of its hydrogen has already been transformed into helium and now the star is busy burning the remains of its stellar fuel and gradually expanding in size. Arcturus is also the brightest star of a great stellar stream named in its honor. This gargantuan structure is in fact the debris of a dwarf galaxy absorbed by the Milky Way some 2 billion years ago. It contains 53 stars. Most of them are old and dim and not nearly as impressive as Arcturus. Arcturus emits 170 times as much luminous energy as the Sun, although its surface temperature is much lower at just 4,251 Kelvin. It is thought that this giant used to be quite like our Sun because its mass is just 10% bigger. But what with the inevitable depletion of its stellar fuel and the inner pressure of its scorching hot plasma, the star turned into an orange giant whose radius is now 25 times that of the Sun. According to today's theory of stellar evolution, this is something that our Sun is expected to go through in the distant future too. Arcturus's age is gauged at anything from 6 to 8.5 billion years. It is hard to predict when it will go supernova at the end of its life cycle, but it will happen quite soon in astronomical terms. Shedding its outer layers, Arcturus will become a scorching hot white dwarf, destined to slowly cool off in the course of billions of years to follow. The second component of the system is barely visible against the background of its giant companion. This small star with luminosity 20 times lower than that of Arcturus lies so close to it that it's hardly possible to define its parameters. Even if some planets did manage to form in this stellar system, many millions of years ago they must have been absorbed by Arcturus itself. Either way, no objects have been detected in the star's environs at this point. The year 2003. As the starry sky was being routinely observed, a small yellow dwarf was detected in the Phoenix constellation. It was later to be dubbed WASP-96. The year 2013. The Super Wasp Orbital Telescope detected an extremely rarefied gas giant in the immediate vicinity of the star. A preliminary spectral analysis of its atmosphere revealed that it was remarkably transparent and practically devoid of any water vapor. The year 2022. Analysis of the object's atmosphere was conducted again this time with the help of the new generation orbital telescope James Webb. 
which offered an unprecedented accuracy. Scientists were taken aback. If the new data were to be believed, the exoplanet was supposed to be shrouded in thick layers of clouds, which was the exact opposite of what the previous observations had revealed. Thus, the data from the James Webb was in conflict with the earlier estimates, and the degree of our understanding of the universe was questioned yet again. So, what is this amazing telescope like? And what has it seen in the depths of space so far? Let's take a closer look at it. The history of the largest modern orbital telescope began back in 1996. Its development and modernization took as long as 25 years, after which the spacecraft left our planet and set out on its journey through space. It took James Webb a month to reach its destination point, located one and a half million kilometers from our planet. Because the telescope is equipped with high-precision infrared sensors, it can see the dimmest and most distant space objects hidden in the depths of the universe. However, this unmatched sensitivity also has a downside. The intense radiation from the Earth, the Moon and the Sun interferes with the faint signals of distant stars and exoplanets. Therefore, in order to counteract this effect, the super-sensitive instruments were covered with a multi-layer heat-reflecting screen. The observatory itself had to be moved away from large celestial bodies and be located near the so-called second Lagrange point in the shadow of our planet. Still, the obtained results were absolutely worth all the effort, because James Webb helped us make quite a number of amazing discoveries pretty much from the very first days of its operation. With some of them quite expected, others, on the other hand, prompted additional questions. One of the studies with a paradoxical outcome was the spectral analysis of WASP-96b, a glowing exoplanet of extremely low density. It is located 0.045 astronomical units from its parent star and completes a full orbit around it in just three and a half days. According to calculations, the mass of the celestial body is half the mass of Jupiter and its diameter is 20% more than that of Jupiter. Because of the extreme proximity to the star, the temperature of the object's outer layers is quite high and reaches 1,285 Kelvin or just over 1,000 degrees Celsius. Exoplanets of this type fall in the category of hot Jupiters and are distinguished by large losses of atmosphere due to stellar wind. Earlier measurements showed very clear lines of sodium in the atmosphere of WASP-96b which was interpreted by the researchers as a sign of an unusually clean and cloudless atmosphere. The fact is that according to the available models of the structure of gas giants, this element can exist only in the planet's interior. As we can see traces of it, it means that the upper regions of the celestial body's atmosphere practically do not absorb light. It was assumed that thanks to this, the ultra-sensitive detectors of James Webb could look into the deepest layers of the exoplanet. However, the information obtained by the telescope turned out to be radically different. The outer layers of the gas giant contain great amounts of water vapor. It condenses in the upper atmosphere and can form a large haze or thick clouds, reflecting some of the light shed on it. Because of this, the temperature of the lower layers of the object may differ significantly from the calculated values. Perhaps the accuracy of the earlier study was insufficient, or else some of the data was misinterpreted. It is also possible that we do not yet know of a certain factor that would allow us to combine the results to form a single correct picture. WASP-96b remains a mystery, which means it still needs to be studied in more detail. Of course, James Webb's discoveries do not end there. For example, 69 light-years away, 
there is an unusual system consisting of three brown dwarfs at once. These cosmic bodies are too big to be planets and at the same time too small to launch a stable thermonuclear reaction in their interior. Brown dwarfs are usually difficult to detect as the radiation of their surface is extremely low. But James Webb sees the universe primarily in infrared, which makes it easy to distinguish objects that are virtually invisible in the optical range. The two largest components of the system are very similar in their characteristics and are located quite close to each other. The distance between them is about two astronomical units, and their total mass is slightly more than a hundred times that of Jupiter. The temperature of both objects is relatively high, reaching 2600 Kelvin or slightly over 2300 degrees Celsius. The third component of the system is at a much greater distance, about a hundred astronomical units from the center. Its mass is between 14 and 23 Jupiter masses and its radius is 20% more than that of Jupiter. Also, this brown dwarf is about twice as cold as its more massive companions. Observations reveal that the temperature of its outer layers is 1240 Kelvin or slightly below 1000 degrees Celsius. Nevertheless, the celestial body is considerably warmer than the gas giants in our system, especially given the absence of a star that would give it heat. It was surprising to find that the outer layers of this brown dwarf contain not only the usual components such as water, methane or carbon dioxide, but also minute particles of various silicon compounds. The simplest of these is quartz, but more complex substances have also been detected. These are thought to be concentrated in the atmosphere of the celestial body in the form of vast clouds. The existence of such clusters had previously been predicted from theoretical considerations, because silicon, being a product of stellar thermonuclear reactions, is quite widespread in the universe. Still, until recently, observations have not been able to confirm this hypothesis. It is thought that about 140 million years ago, there was a single gas dust cloud in the system's place which later split into three independent clumps. This event may have been caused by the gravitational influence of a massive celestial body that passed close to the protostellar nebula. Remarkably, if the separation had not occurred, the total mass of the formed object would have been enough to start a self-sustaining thermonuclear reaction. In this case, instead of three brown dwarfs, we might have been observing a single tiny star. Incidentally, the James Webb equipment is capable of observing not only single objects tucked away in the depths of space, but tremendous space structures as well, that stretch for hundreds of light years. One of them is the Carina Nebula, which is one of the largest stellar nurseries in our galaxy. This bright and vast cluster is located about 8,500 light years from the Earth and has a mass of up to 900,000 suns. It contains not only giant clouds of interstellar gas and dust, but also thousands of stars, from the smallest ones to the most gigantic. This is where two of the Milky Way's brightest objects are located, Eta Carinae and WR25. The luminosity of each is several million times greater than that of the Sun. Unique objects like that certainly attract astronomers' attention. Besides, James Webb's infrared cameras are able to pick out great numbers of stars in the dusty haze, which were previously unknown to us. The point is that it is in this area in space that hundreds of young stars are constantly getting born. According to modern concepts, new stars are formed by gravitational forces that compress and heat up clouds of cosmic dust. During its evolutionary process, a protostar goes through several stages until finally a thermonuclear reaction kicks in in its interior. This theory has been confirmed by multiple observations, but many details of this long and complex process currently remain understudied. The formation of a new star sometimes takes millions of years, 
but astronomers don't need that long to observe it. Thanks to James Webb's infrared sensors, thousands of protostars and young stars at various stages of evolution have been detected in the Carina Nebula. It is important to note that all these objects formed within the same gas cloud, which means that they are very similar in terms of composition and age. By observing them, researchers can fully trace the process of star formation and better understand what forces are involved. Some phases of this process predicted only in theory take hours or days and with James Webb, the chance of capturing them is greatly enhanced. For all we know, we may soon be able to admire a photo of a young star flaring up thousands of light years from the Sun. Meanwhile, an 18-section mirror 6.5 meters in diameter and an onboard array of high-accuracy instruments allow James Webb to capture light from objects much further away, at the very edge of the visible universe. They are more than 13 billion years old, giving us a glimpse of the earliest times immediately after the hypothetical Big Bang. However, even James Webb would not have been able to see their luminescence but for one unique coincidence. The phenomenon of gravitational lensing has long been known to scientists. This physical phenomenon helps us to better see into the depths of the universe. And this is how it works. A powerful gravity generated by a massive body focuses and amplifies the light from a source behind it. Such an effect can be produced only on condition that a great many factors happily combine, so it is not surprising that it is one of the rarest phenomena in the universe. It is all the more surprising that while observing the galaxy cluster SMAX 0723, located about 4 billion light years from the Earth, James Webb captured light of a space object passing through gravitational lenses as many as three times. In total, the radiation was amplified about 20 times, without which astronomers would hardly have been able to distinguish it from background noise. The object is thought to be a distant and very old galaxy, whose age is estimated to be 13 billion years. About 10 other star clusters have also been detected, which are thought to have originated between 200 and 700 million years after the genesis of the universe. According to some observations, they have a complex structure which takes tens of millions of years to form. This discovery will allow scientists to develop the existing ideas about the early stages of the universe's evolution and may even prompt to question its age. Unfortunately, we still know very little about such remote times and James Webb will surely help us learn more about them. The first steps in theoretical confirmation of there being ocean worlds out there that is, planets fully covered in water, were made back in the 1970s. That is when evidence was found that radioactive decay in a planet's interior and tidal forces may cause water ice to melt and subsequently form huge oceans. In all likelihood, similar processes take place on Jupiter's and Saturn's satellites. However, these celestial bodies remain icebound as they lie too far away from the Sun whose rays would otherwise melt the thick layers of ice. But when we talk about an ocean planet, a slightly different type of space object is meant. The term implies that the ocean on a planet's surface isn't concealed under a layer of ice, and its depth measures more than 100 kilometers. Theoretical calculations of these planets' formation and evolution processes were carried out in 2004 by French astrophysicists headed by Christophe Satan. According to this theory, if the mass of a forming planet is more than 10 times that of the Earth, this starts to actively attract hydrogen and helium from the gas and dust cloud around it. In this manner, with time, it grows into a gas giant. By contrast, if this planet's mass is just 6 to 8 Earth masses, the new planet is going to be comprised of ice and rocks roughly in equal measure. Just to compare, the mass total of all water in the global ocean on our Earth accounts for just 0.025% of the Earth's total mass. In this case, 
provided a space object's orbit lies far from the host star, this object is going to be either an ice giant or a cold super-Earth. Radioactive decay taking place inside the core will help melt some portion of the ice, which in its turn will help form a subsurface ocean, but the planet's outer layers will still remain frozen. If the planet happens to find itself in its star's habitable zone, its outer layers will melt and spill all over the surface in a boundless ocean. Theoretical calculations show that a planet with a mass six to eight times that of the Earth may have a layer of water over a hundred kilometers thick. The pressure exerted by this amount of water may reach 20,000 atmospheres, depending on temperature, impurities and other parameters. This is enough for some special exotic varieties of ice to form, like ones remaining solid even at high temperatures. In addition, unlike the familiar water ice, these modifications would be heavier than liquid water. For example, the density of ice 7, which is likely to form in these conditions, should be around 1,650 kilos per cubic meter. This ice settles on the planet's ocean's bottom and forms a massive cryosphere that envelops the more massive core. The opportunity to put these theoretical assumptions to test arose when a tiny and dim star was spotted 42 light-years away from the Earth. It was dubbed Gliese 1214. The diameter of this red dwarf turned out to be five times smaller than that of the Sun, with its mass just 15.7% that of the Sun. At the same time, Gliese 1214 is 300 times dimmer than our parent star, while its surface temperature is only 3000 Kelvin, or 2700 degrees Celsius. There is nothing particularly remarkable about the star itself. To be blunt, it is just another nondescript red dwarf that looks like any of the billions of other stars in our galaxy. However, in 2009, a solitary planet was detected in its environs, which was dubbed Gliese 1214b. With its diameter measuring two and a half times that of the Earth, this exoplanet is just six and a half times heavier than our home planet. Straightforward calculations show the freefall acceleration on the exoplanet's surface to be just 91% that of the Earth. The average density of Gliese 1214b is approximately 1,870 kilos per cubic meter. Judging by this comparatively small value, the exoplanet cannot realistically be made up of mostly metals and rocks, as is the case with our Earth, for example. But incidentally, this average density value seems to confirm the assumption that the astronomical body is 75% water or water ice and just 25% rocks. Thus, it appears safe to suggest that this exoplanet is an ocean planet. The object lies very close to its host star. The average distance between them measures just around 2 million kilometers, or 0.014 astronomical units, which is 75 times smaller than that between the Earth and the Sun. Also, the orbit eccentricity is rather high at 0.27, slightly more than that of Pluto. This means that in its perihelion, Gliese 1214b is approximately twice as close to its star than when in its aphelion. As for its orbital period, it takes the planet about 36 hours to complete it. The red dwarf Gliese 1214 may be 300 times dimmer than the Sun, but this incredible proximity to the star makes the climate on Gliese 1214b scorching hot. Supposing the reflection coefficient of the surface of Gliese 1214b is the same as that of Venus, the planet's surface temperature is supposed to be around 393 Kelvin or 120 degrees Celsius. If, on the other hand, the surface is darker, the temperature may reach as much as 553 Kelvin or 280 degrees Celsius. Due to the fact that the orbit of Gliese 1214b crosses the star's disk, scientists are able to carry out spectroscopic investigations of its atmosphere. Still, the results are rather ambiguous. If this space object really is an ocean planet, its atmosphere is supposed to predominantly consist of water vapor with some accompanying gases. Interestingly, 
No lines of hydrogen, helium or complex substances like water, CO2 and ammonia have so far been detected in the planet's spectrum. It is thought that the outer layer of the dense atmosphere conceals its true content from the observer. The conditions on the surface of Gliese 1214b remind one of what it is like inside a giant steam boiler. Interestingly, the atmospheric pressure in its lower strata should be at least 15 times as high as that of the Earth. As the ocean and the atmosphere are in a state of thermodynamic equilibrium, the border between them is rather blurred. No wonder, as the density of water vapor just above the ocean's surface is practically equal to that of constantly boiling water. As we look deeper, at the lower strata of the ocean, the pressure will continue to increase until we reach the depth of 100 kilometers. With a pressure value at this depth, water will be unable to remain in its liquid state even at temperatures this high. And so we will see the bottom made up of dense and heavy ice, whose thickness is estimated to be upwards of 5,000 kilometers. Thus, most water on the planet is concentrated here. Below the cryosphere, there should be the core, made up of rocks and metals. Unfortunately, chances of life evolving on any ocean planet are rather thin, even if the surface temperature happens to be more favorable than on this one. This is so due to the fact that oceans on planets like that are too poor in terms of microelements that are vital for living creatures. Even taking into account meteorites, that occasionally bombard the surfaces of these celestial bodies, the chemical diversity is simply not good enough for life to originate here. Still, studying ocean planets poses a great scientific interest. According to NASA's mathematical modeling estimates published in 2020, there may be billions of planets of this type in our galaxy both cold, harboring an ocean under an ice shell, and warm, like Gliese 1214b. Water is one of the most widespread complex chemical compounds in the universe, and this means that the chances of discovering new ocean planets are quite optimistic. The first exoplanets were discovered back in the late 1980s, since then, the number of detected ones has increased hundredfold. According to statistics from January 2021, over 4,000 planets in other systems have already been discovered. Apart from these, several thousand candidates likely to be given the status have been registered. With sufficient evidence from Earth-based observatories, most of them are going to become officially confirmed exoplanets. The overall number of planets in our galaxy may supposedly be over 1 trillion. From 5 to 20% of these are close to our Earth in terms of their size and composition. Not all of them are in their host star's Goldilocks zones, that is, not all of them are habitable. Still, according to scientific estimates, there are not less than 300 million potentially habitable planets in the Milky Way. Exoplanets differ very much in terms of their environment. Their dimensions may be enormous, some even beating Jupiter, but there are also comparatively smaller ones, close to our Earth in size. Some of these bodies are hot, consumed with oceans of molten lava, whereas others are encased in a shell of permanent ice. There are planets out there made entirely of oceans, with not a bit of dry land on them while in others, sulfuric acid drains or diamond snow are a regular occurrence. Various techniques are used for discovering other worlds. As a rule, it is next to impossible to spot an exoplanet by simply looking through a telescope. That is why in 2009, Kepler was launched, the first space telescope designed for searching for planets beyond the boundaries of the solar system. The telescope's cameras had 42 charge-coupled devices, or CCDs, with a total resolution of around 96 megapixels. With a field of view covering about 25% of the sky, and coupled with a 1.5 meter mirror of the telescope, it was able to detect astronomical bodies within 3,000 light-years from the Earth. In the three and a half years of productive operations, Kepler managed to spot over 3,500 exoplanet candidates.
The status of over 2,000 of these has already been confirmed by repeated observations. It was in this period that the smallest of known exoplanets today was detected. The diameter of Kepler 37b is just 35.7% that of the Earth. The telescope was also instrumental in registering several stars and brown dwarfs. The transit method was used by Kepler in the search for exoplanets. This method is based on observing the star's luminosity. If the supposed planet passes between the parent star and the observer, this will be noticed in the telltale decrease in the star's luminosity. The extent of these fluctuations in luminosity directly depends on the ratio of the star's and planet's dimensions, while their regularity allows one to estimate the object's orbital period. The transit method requires accuracy in measurements. Changes in a star's spectrum account for less than 2% and are usually tenths or even hundredths of 1%. Ripples in the atmosphere, dust and precipitations negatively affect results produced by Earth-based telescopes. That is the reason why telescopes based on automatic space stations are used for searching for objects beyond the boundaries of the solar system. Unfortunately, in 2013, three and a half years into the mission, the Kepler Space Telescope had several major equipment failures. In 2018, the spacecraft ended science operations completely. Kepler was the first spacecraft to be created specifically for looking for exoplanets. However, most of the objects it managed to spot happened to be too remote and dim to study them in any satisfying detail. That is why the next space research complex had slightly different parameters. Kepler was succeeded by the TESS telescope launched by NASA on the 18th of April 2018. Its main object was searching for rocky exoplanets, orbiting the brightest stars within 200 light years from the Sun. This telescope also used the transit method. And here is the spacecraft's brief profile. TESS is equipped with four refractors with a 24 by 24 degree field of view and a 10 cm aperture. The spacecraft's peculiar orbit allows it to cover both the northern and the southern parts of the sky, which is approximately 85% of the entire sky. Photos are taken by four cameras and the resolution of each camera's CCD is 16.8 megapixels. TOI 700D is one of the most notable objects discovered by TESS. This exoplanet became the first object of the kind comparable to the Earth in size and which found itself in the habitable zone of its star. It orbits TOI 700, a red dwarf lying slightly over a hundred light years away from the Sun. It is a small and rather cold star. Its temperature is half that of the Sun and its mass and radius are just 40% those of the Sun. TOI 700 is peculiar for its high stability. Not a single flare has been registered on it since the beginning of observations. A star's stability is a positive feature, because bursts of activity are able to divest its planets of their atmospheres and be generally pernicious for potential life on planet's surfaces. There are at least three planets orbiting TOI 700. The one closest to it, TOI 700b, is comparable to the Earth in size. Its mass is approximately 1.07 times that of our planet, and its radius differs from that of the Earth by not more than 2%. Unfortunately, TOI 700b is too close to its host star. It is within about 0.06 astronomical units, and a year on the planet lasts just 10 days. In addition to that, chances are it is tidally locked, that is, it faces the star with one in the same side. This means that the planet is likely to be scorching hot. The planet lying further from its star, TOI 700c, is thought to be a mini-Neptune. Its mass may be from 5 to 13 times that of our Earth, and its radius is 2 or 3 times that of the Earth. It takes TOI 700c 16 days to complete one orbit around its host star. Located closer to the star than the inner border of the habitable zone, it must be too hot for life to originate and evolve there.
TOI 700D is the third and at this point the remotest planet in the system discovered by now. It takes 37.4 days to complete a full orbit, which by the way lies along the inner edge of the habitable zone. The mass of TOI 700D hasn't been gauged precisely and may be anything from one to three times that of the Earth. At the same time, the planet's radius is just 20 to 30 percent bigger than that of the Earth. TOI 700D is thought to be a rocky world, but its exact composition is not yet known. The amount of energy received by the planet from its star is 86 percent that of the amount we receive from the Sun. Assuming the planet's atmosphere is similar to ours, the steady state temperature on the surface of TOI 700D is estimated at 268.8 Kelvin, or 4.3 degrees Celsius below zero. However, due to the greenhouse effect, or rather features of the atmosphere we may not know yet, this figure may shift either up or down. There is no precise data on the eccentricity of TOI 700D, but it is thought to be small at around 0.11. As the planet's orbit finds itself at the inner edge of the Goldilocks zone, the planet's eccentricity, however small, may incidentally turn out to be perceptible when the planet comes too close to its star from time to time, thus actually leaving the habitable zone. Still, with a year on the planet lasting slightly over one Earth month, such unfavorable periods are expected to be rather short. If there are living creatures on TOI 700D, then they might be able to weather the harsh spells in a state of anabiosis. Alternatively, they could adapt or migrate to less inclement areas. Even though the data acquired by spectral analysis of TOI 700D can't be enough for making conclusions, there is a chance that there is liquid water on the planet's surface. Then there is bound to be the greenhouse effect too, which will help the surface temperature to reach favorable values. As I've already mentioned, TOI 700D, along with the other known planets in the system, is highly likely to be tidally locked to its star. If this is the case, there should be a stark difference in temperatures between the sunny side and the shadow side. This contrast could be leveled off by a dense atmosphere, but that would cause powerful hurricane winds. Although the main mission of TESS has been accomplished by now, it still has enough resources to carry on operations. The telescope will continue taking snapshots of the sky, including the Milky Way plane, which is the most challenging direction for observation. Over 2,100 exoplanet candidates have been discovered by TESS in the course of the main mission. Not less than 66 of them have already been confirmed. Apart from that, Six supernovae flares have been registered, three exocomets identified, and a great number of photos taken of small bodies in the solar system. The latter were not objects of the main mission, but are of course of scientific interest. TOI 700D is still guarding its mysteries and waiting for its explorers. Great hopes are placed on the new orbital telescope James Webb, which may help investigate this world and a number of other ones. The new telescope is supposed to provide images of not only exoplanets lying closest, but also detect their moons and carry out spectral analysis of their surfaces. The launch of the telescope is planned for the 31st of October 2021. If all goes according to plan, first data will be available as soon as next year. Distances from the Milky Way to other galaxies are by all accounts mind-boggling. As a rule, it is anything from millions to billions of light years. Due to the universe's cosmological expansion, the distance between the Earth and any remote object in the universe is constantly growing, which makes the light emanating from this object look redder than it actually is. This phenomenon is known as a redshift. It is of great help in gauging distances and velocities on the astronomical scale. Alternatively, some galaxies' spectrum is blue-shifted, which means that they are not on an escape trajectory from us, but on the contrary are moving to meet us. One of these unusual space objects is the galaxy M86 in the Virgo cluster. Roughly 52 million light-years away from the Sun, 
It is moving towards the Milky Way at a speed of around 244 km per second, which makes it one of the fastest moving blue shifted galaxies. By moving at a high speed through the scattered gas the Virgo cluster is filled with, M86 is constantly shedding its own interstellar matter. As a result of this process, it leaves a trail of long lines of warm ionized hydrogen behind. M86 is connected with the almost destroyed spiral galaxy NGC 4438 with several of these filaments. These two galaxies are thought to have collided at some point in the distant past, which was the smaller one's undoing. Interestingly, M86 is known to have destroyed its other neighbors in the past as well. Several stellar streams have been detected in its halo that are likely to be the remains of smaller galaxies absorbed earlier. An impressive number of globular clusters in its structure is another outstanding feature of M86. Observations show that their number is upwards of 3,800, which is around 25 times as many as in the Milky Way. There is a theory that claims these clusters to be the remains of dwarf galaxies that M86 would have absorbed in the past. If it really is the case, then it would have destroyed tens or even hundreds of other galaxies. Having said that, M86 looks anything but unique. The galaxy ESO 137-001, which we'll be looking at next, has a similar shape. But unlike M86, it appears more outlandishly original. Located 227 million light-years away from the Sun, it is as heavy as 5 to 14 billion solar masses. As for its stars, most of them are young and bright blue giants. ESO 137-001 in its turn is part of Abel 3627, a large galaxy cluster. Moving to its center at an incredible speed of almost 2000 km per second, the galaxy collides with interstellar gas pressure inside the cluster. As a result, its own gas is blown out, leaving behind tails that stretch for up to 260,000 light years. Incidentally, the mass of interstellar gas in those areas is due to four times that of the gas inside the galaxy. It is hardly surprising that starbursts are a common thing here. That is, stars don't stop forming in these enormous streams made up mostly of hydrogen. When seen from the side, ESO 137-001 appears like a giant jellyfish floating through endless expanses of space. Unfortunately, as the galaxy is continuously stripped of its interstellar gas, its life expectancy diminishes too. With not much material left, no new stars can form here, which greatly affects the structure of the spiral arms and central bulge of the galaxy. On the bright side, scientists have a chance of finding out more about dark matter and its interaction with other space objects by observing the behavior of the gas streams left in the galaxy's wake. Speaking about the formation of new stars, there is a galaxy with a name that speaks for itself. Baby Boom. Around 4,000 stars are born here every year, which is about 400 times more than in the Milky Way. Straightforward calculations show that on average, a new star lights up in this area of space every two hours. The Baby Boom galaxy lies around 12.2 billion light years away from the Earth. This means that what we see when observing it is what was happening just one and a half billion years after the hypothetical Big Bang. It was a time when the universe was still in the process of forming its structure. What is taking place in the galaxy now is drastically different from what we expect to observe there in theory based on what we know about star formation. The reasons why stars are produced here at such an astounding rate are not known yet. But it is beyond any doubt that Baby Boom is able to provide us with a lot of information about the early stages of our universe's evolution. One of the few galaxies one can observe through an amateur telescope is the so-called Sombrero Galaxy, official designation M104. It lies 30 million light-years away from the Sun and its diameter is roughly four times smaller than that of the Milky Way. The Sombrero Galaxy's outstanding feature is a massive ring of dust and cold hydrogen enveloping it. Observations show that it is here that most young stars are born. In addition to the peculiar ring, the Sombrero Galaxy is also remarkable for its elaborate inner makeup. 
observations with the Spitzer Space Telescope show that most stars in this galaxy form a structure typical of elliptical galaxies. The stars here are mostly rather old yellow and red dwarfs. The other stars here, on the other hand, form spiral structures concealed within an elliptical cloud. It is thought that this phenomenon is a result of two galaxies' collision, with their stars subsequently and almost inevitably mingling together. It is incredible that the galactic structures survived a merge of that scale with minimal damage, are none the worse for this tremendous collision and can still be observed. Another peculiar feature in the Sombrero galaxy is exceptionally powerful X-ray radiation emanating from the center. It is assumed that the accretion disk of a supermassive black hole may be its source. The mass of the hole is estimated to be over a billion solar masses, which makes this enormous object one of the most massive black holes known to science today. There are also several sources of tremendously high frequency or terahertz radiation detected within the galaxy although today their nature is still a mystery. Our galactic parade today is concluded with yet another object boasting an elaborate inner structure, the Eerie M64 galaxy, rather aptly dubbed the Black Eye Galaxy. The nickname comes from a dark band of cosmic dust that partly conceals the galaxy's center from the observer on the Earth. Due to this line of cosmic dust, as well as the exceptionally bright active nucleus, it is impossible to estimate the black eye's number of stars even roughly. What we do know is that it is comparatively small and not so remote. Its radius measures 25,000 light years and it lies approximately 17 million light years away from the Milky Way. The black eye galaxy is made up of two well-defined parts. Interestingly, the inner disk with a bulge rotate in the direction opposite to that of the outer ring. The most likely explanation for such a bizarre makeup is that the galaxy formed after two smaller ones collided and merged in the distant past. Admittedly, it would take a combination of a number of mutually independent factors for such a fascinating and well-defined structure to form. For example, the progenitor galaxies would have moved at specific velocities and come together at a certain angle. The odds of a success would have been minuscule. Before we get started, we have to decide what it is we're looking for. What could be called the center of the universe? The central point of the solar system is the common center of the masses of all the objects it is comprised of, which in essence is almost at the center of the Sun. There is a similar central point for the Milky Way and for the Virgo supercluster that our galaxy is part of. Can we carry on in the same manner and eventually pinpoint the pivot of the entire universe? If we look at the large-scale structure of the universe, we will notice the following. Stars form galaxies of three basic types. Spiral, elliptical and irregular. It is quite easy to find the central point in the first two, whereas it is considerably harder to do so in those of the latter type. Moving on, Galaxies group together to form clusters and superclusters. These, in their turn, form galactic filaments. These filaments, distributed all over the universe, are interspersed with mysterious areas of almost total emptiness. Voids. Voids are areas so enormous that they would easily accommodate thousands of galaxies. The large-scale structure of the universe is made up of these two global components. By the way, we have a special video about voids, so feel free to check it out if you haven't seen it yet. Now, seen on the scale of hundreds of megaparsecs, the universe turns out to be quite homogeneous. Its makeup resembles a sponge. It goes without saying that there are massive matter flows and points of matter attraction like the dark flow and the great attractor, but their influence is not global enough to make them suitable candidates for the center of the universe. To date, no object has been discovered in the visible universe that would qualify to be the common center of gravity. In fact, if it did exist out there, its influence would be too pervasive not to be noticed. It is actually according to the fundamental cosmological principle that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. This means that the universe would look the same, irrespective of either the whereabouts of the observer or the direction we choose to look in. 
The cosmological principle was formulated based on copious observations of remote areas of the universe and is applicable on the scale of hundreds of millions of light years. If the potential observer on the Earth inquiringly gazed at the universe all round, it would appear to be a sphere with a radius measuring 46 billion light years, its center being in the solar system. This is the actual distance to the remotest visible object, although it took its light approximately 13.8 billion years to reach our Earth. The sphere is known as the observable universe, or metagalaxy. However, it would be erroneous to consider our location the center of the universe. This is pretty much like claiming you're in the middle of the planet, when in reality you are simply at the center of a circle drawn by the horizon on the planet's surface all around you. The metagalaxy has equal chances of being either a small part of the universe or constituting it in its entirety. It is quite impossible at this point to find this out for certain. Let's assume there is no pivot we can pinpoint in the universe today. Perhaps we should try a different tack then. According to contemporary scientific views, the universe was born approximately 13.8 billion years ago as a result of the event generally referred to as the Big Bang. Before that, time and space as we know them were virtually non-existent. It appears logical to suppose, therefore, that if there was a bang, it had to have a center. In other words, the starting point of all. Let's sneak a peek at the past. The consequences of the early stages of the universe's evolution still widely manifest themselves. The ones that stand out are the cosmological expansion of space and the cosmic microwave background radiation, or the CMB radiation. Would observing these phenomena bear fruit? Would it be possible to locate the central point? And did it exist at all? The cosmological expansion of the universe is an isotropic and homogeneous expansion of space from point to point. It may seem that it would be enough to just measure the velocity and direction of this expansion and then rewind time, as it were, thus tracing the motion back to its origins at the center. But this isn't quite as simple as that. Straightforward calculations would show the center of the universe's expansion to be in really close proximity to the solar system. On more precise observation, it will turn out that the supposed center of the Big Bang lands right on top of the observer. However, the tricky part is that even if we were to travel to any other point in space, like a few light years away, it is this point that would appear to be the center from which space objects recede. Strangely, the result will be the same in any point in the universe. Here is an example I've already told you about in our video about the universe's expansion. Imagine a balloon filled with air with a few dots marked on it. They're motionless relative to each other, but if we pump more air into the balloon, the distances between the dots will grow. At the same time, obviously none of them may be considered the center of the balloon's expansion. The dots recede from each other at a steady pace, and the rate of this process depends on the distances between them. The notion of the event horizon is inferred from the concept of the expansion of the universe. Since the rate at which objects recede depends on the distances between them, at a certain point the observable object is bound to move away from us at a rate exceeding the speed of light. According to the special theory of relativity, this implies that any interaction with that object will be impossible. Objects beyond the event horizon are as well as gone for the observer we will never find out what will happen to them next. In this respect, the universe is a sphere with the consciously assigned center at the point of observation and its limit is marked by the event horizon. Different values for its radius may be produced in different models of the universe, but it definitely measures over 14 billion light years. However, any other point in the universe will have its own event horizon. That is why it would not be fair to favor the position of the observer and see it as the center of the universe. It is hardly necessary to point out that the number of such like centers would be infinite. 
So it looks like there is no way we can find the center of the universe with the help of its cosmological expansion. How about relic radiation then? Relic radiation, or the CMB radiation, is high-frequency background radiation that permeates the universe in all directions. Its temperature, which is approximately 2.7 Kelvin, slowly drops on account of the universe's expansion. The CMB radiation is an important source of information as it originated in the early stages of the universe's evolution as a result of massive recombination of protons. Relic radiation used to be considered homogeneous and isotropic for a long time. This means that a detector at any point in the universe and aimed in any direction should show the same density of the radiation. However, in recent years, quite a few areas were found not to conform to this rule. It is the case with voids, for example. The CMB temperatures in these dark areas are minuscule portions of a Kelvin lower than the CMB temperature in the rest of space. There are other areas in the universe where the cosmic microwave background is anything but isotropic. For instance, photons may be swallowed up by a cloud of hot gas or may end up in a powerful gravitational field. Besides, as the Sun, along with all of its planets, goes round the center of the Milky Way, this motion causes the CMB spectre to shift depending on the direction of measurement. To put it simply, the Earth moves away from the CMB radiation flow aimed at its back, as it were, while meeting the CMB radiation flow aimed at its front. This produces the Doppler effect that causes the observed radiation to shift to the red or the blue band, respectively. Still, all cases of manifested anisotropy of the CMB are secondary. They are the consequences of the interaction between the CMB radiation and heavy objects, or alternatively voids. According to contemporary science, there may well have been primary deviations that occurred in the earliest stages of the universe's expansion. If they were to be discovered, they would make a great source of valuable information about events taking place in the first seconds after the birth of space and time as we more or less know them. Unfortunately, primary anisotropy of the CMB radiation hasn't been discovered experimentally yet. To sum up, on balance, no point in space should be considered its center. The expansion of the universe occurs simultaneously across its entire infinity and no special area can be realistically and accurately singled out. On the ultimate global level, there isn't a single mass center that could play the role of the pivot with all other space rotating on it. However, this mysterious place may well exist, but too far away from us. The dimensions of the universe still haven't been gauged with a satisfying degree of accuracy, since even the latest cutting-edge measuring equipment produced by the human civilization isn't able to reach beyond the event horizon. The part of space that can be observed by us may well be a minuscule droplet in comparison with the rich ocean of the universe. And it is hardly feasible that we will ever be able to appreciate it in its entirety. There are billions of objects across the universe and each of them is uniquely fascinating. Discussing them may go on forever, and we're going to continue our journey in our future videos. Telescopes and observatories keep supplying fresh data about space, constantly updating details to the major riddle called the universe. Are we to observe it in its entirety someday? We just have to wait and see.